We have been in the midst of a series of sermons for several weeks, and uh, we have titled this series of sermons on leaning on the everlasting arms. And what we've been doing is focusing upon the faith that the Bible talks about that we're to obtain and to be able to have. One of the things about a church and a church family and our brothers and sisters in the Lord is that our faith can encourage others and others, their faith encourages us. And and I talked about that last week of passing that baton off, that baton of faith to our children and to our children's children. And that is so important for us to understand how vital that responsibility is. And as you go through the Bible, and especially in Hebrews chapter 11, we find that there's numbers of Old Testament characters remind us of how they have exercised their faith in the Lord and how that faith has encouraged us. Well, we're going to do the same thing today. We're going to go look at an Old Testament character, a man by the name of Abraham, of how he exercised faith. And the Bible says, and imputed unto him righteousness. In other words, he came to have a relationship with God himself by that element of faith. Friend, I'm here to remind you, you cannot have a relationship, you cannot know who God is without the element of faith. And so therefore, we want to learn how that faith comes to pass. So I invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul does a tremendous job in the fourth chapter of reminding us of how that faith that Abraham has and had can be contagious to us. In other words, that we grasp hold of that type of faith. So with your Bibles in the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, we're going to begin reading. In fact, I tell you what let's do. Let's go, go back to verse 13. I, I was going to start at verse 16, but I really believe we need to go back to verse 13, get the whole understanding of what he is talking about. <coughs> I've had this... Uh, <clears throat> congestion this past week, so please forgive me if I, if I, uh, my voice kind of crackles a little bit this morning. Uh, would you stand with me in reverence of reading God's Word? Now, notice what the Apostle Paul says, starting in verse 13 of the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. For he says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but notice what he says, but through the righteousness of what? Faith. Well, underline that. That is the key of understanding the remaining part of this passage of Scripture. For he says in verse 14, <clears throat> For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is 
no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. That's another key word. Faith and grace, they go hand to hand. You can't have one without the other. If you want the grace of God to be expressed in your life, God requires you to have faith. And so, therefore, he goes on to say, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. <coughs> As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall all descendants be, and not being weak in faith. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Now, notice what he says in verse 22. Oh, such a very important verse. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Boy, I'm telling you, we can camp out here this morning. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look, take this passage of Scripture and dissect it and just see what God has placed before us of how our faith is so vital in our relationship with him today. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that you came into this world and that you took upon the form of man and that there upon that form of man, that you were fully man as well as fully God. One that who knew no sin, but yet became sin. And there upon the cross of Calvary, you died and paid the ransom price for the sins of mankind. And that you were buried and the Bible says you rose again, victorious over death, victorious over the grave, victorious over the judgment of hell, and that you come to deliver to us today the keys of eternal life. And by faith you remind us that we respond to that by accepting you. And so, Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God may be upon us today and that he would anoint us and fill us and use us as we hear, as we speak, 
as we listen, as we obey. For we know that it's for one reason and one reason only, and that is for the glory and the honor and the praise of our precious Savior. We ask it in his name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, as you go back and you study this passage of Scripture, what I would encourage you to go back is to go beyond those first few verses of Scripture that we've read, and you'll discover several things that Abraham discovered. Abraham made a tremendous discovery. He first of all discovered that his salvation was not based upon his righteousness. And this is what the Bible says in verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to boast but not before God. In other words, the Bible says that if man can be saved by his own initiative, God would have to share his glory with that man. And God's not going to share his glory with anyone. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come in any other way except by me. So it's not by my righteousness. Because if it was by my righteousness, I could boast and receive glory. But Abraham discovered something else. Not only it was not by righteousness, his righteousness, but by ritual. Listen to what the Bible says in verses 9 and 10. Salvation is not according to ritual. He says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For he goes on to say, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. In other words, Abraham said salvation is not based upon ritual, whether it's circumcision or baptism. You're not saved by that. He goes on to say that that, uh, Abraham was saved even before he was circumcised. But then Abraham discovered something else. Not only it was not by his righteousness and not by by ritual, but also it was not according to his religion. Look what the Bible says in verse 13 and 14. For the promise that we would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. In other words, he said, the law is not the answer. He was saying here that the law was to the Jew. And yet, we began to realize that Jew or Gentile cannot obey the law complete. You're not perfect. And therefore, he began to realize because no one can keep the law that you're not saved by your religion. You're not saved by being a member of a church. You're not saved by being a Baptist, even though being a Baptist is can make you a good Christian, I believe. <laughs> As one man said, what would you be if you were not a Baptist? He said, I'd be sorry. 
Well, the Bible goes on. I'll get away from that. Anyway, <laughs> salvation is not according to your race. Look what he says in verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be f the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, the righteousness might be imputed to them all. Now, Abraham believed that, that of course, blood may be thicker than water, but he recognized that it's not thicker than faith. It is by faith and faith alone that we become children of God. And so it's not according to our race. Just because you're a Jew or just because you're a Gentile, just because you're black or just because you're white, it does not matter. It does not matter whether your mom and dad was Christians or not. I remind you, God does not have grandchildren. He has children. And it's by faith. And then what Abraham did come to recognize, that salvation was according to a relationship with Almighty God. A relationship. Now, how is that relationship established? The relationship that was established with Abraham is exactly the same way it is established with you and God today. It's a personal relationship. As much as I love you and as much as I can pray for you, as much as I love my children and my grandchildren and I pray for them, I cannot make that decision for you or for them. It only comes by you and by faith, Abraham says. So let's look at these passages of Scripture. There's three things I want to remind you about it. The purpose of the, purpose of the faith that we're talking about. The purpose of the faith. Notice what he says in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, what does that refer to? It refers to salvation. It simply refers our relationship with God. Our relationship. In other words, what bridges us between us and Almighty God is two things. His grace and our faith. Our faith in Him and His grace to us. Now, if God's going to save us by his grace, the only response that we can have and the only response that he will accept is our faith. I accept by faith. Faith is the only key that unlocks the door of grace. Several weeks we talked about the grace of God and how wonderful. For by grace you are saved, the writer of Ephesians says. I found it interesting. I was reading this article one time. Excuse me, I might have to quit putting my hands in my pocket. Um, I, I saw this article where uh, two guys were trying to win two Super Bowl tickets and, and they were going to have to do some, some crazy thing 
to win the ticket. And it was by a radio station. And this uh, radio station says, the one that can do the craziest will win the tickets. So these two guys, in cold, wintry day, as the wind was blowing and the wind chill was almost below freeze, they poured maple syrup all for all uh, on both of them. And then after they poured the maple syrup, syrup, they had around them 90 beer bottles. And they took those beer bottles and they poured those beer bottles on top of them. And there they're waiting in this kiddie pool and they're handing out buttons for the radio station. Well, that sounds ridiculous. But they won the prize. I thought to myself, you know, people will do anything to try to win a prize to go to the Super Bowl. But my friend, you don't have to do anything except the Lord Jesus Christ to get to heaven. You don't have to do something ridiculous, audacious. You don't have to do something that is silly. But by faith, you simply accept and receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. The only thing that God requires is by faith. So I want you to notice that faith is approved by God. But not only is it approved by God, faith is accepted by God. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then the Bible goes on to say in verse 16 in this passage of Scripture, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us. In other words, Abraham said that the birthmark of every true child of God is faith. Just simply faith. Faith becomes our father and we become become children of the father. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many has received him, To them he gave the rights to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So precious. So immediately as we study these passages of scriptures, Abraham gives us the purpose of our faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But secondly, I want you to see the prototype of faith that Abraham has been portrayed of. If you want to know how to be saved, if you want to know how to have a relationship with a holy God, many times we learn through others. There's some people sometimes in your your life that has tremendous faith. And what that does, that encourages you to have faith. And it encourages you to model that type of faith even before others as well. God uses that. And so, hear what Paul does. He takes Abraham. Abraham, who is a well-known subject throughout the Bible, And he says in verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. In other words, Abraham becomes a prototype, an example for us today. In other words, anyone, anywhere, any place, any age, 
can exercise the same kind of faith that Abraham. Well, what kind of faith did Abraham exercise? Let's look at it for a few moments. First of all, I want you to notice that his faith was in a person of God. Look what the Bible says in verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. In other words, true faith begins and ends with Almighty God. Have you ever stopped to think about it that when there is unbelief, there's a denial of the character of God. There is a denial of who he is and what he can do. It denies his character. It denies his integrity. It denies his reliability. It denies his power. It denies his presence. So unbelief, my friend, is something that is a sin that's beyond our comprehension. And the only thing that will keep you out of heaven and out of a relationship with a holy God is unbelief. Is he not worthy of our faith? Has he not proven time in and time out of his miraculous works? Has he not proven his love, his grace? Has he not demonstrated his presence? Of course he has. But there's two major doctrines that Abraham talks about. The doctrine of the resurrection and the doctrine of creation. They go hand to hand. And if you deny one, I think you'll deny the other. And if you'll listen to a lot of theologians that claim to be theologians that denies those two things, what they're literally doing is denying Almighty God. Now, if God can raise the dead, he certainly can create the world. And if God can create the world, he certainly can raise the dead. And this is what we're talking about. Now, I believe in creation and not evolution. Amen. I believe that, as we talked about last week, that this world was formed out of nothing and God spoke it into existence. Right. He did not take matter and it evolved into other things. But God taking nothing and creating Everything, the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, the mountains on the hills, the oceans in the waters, God created it all. But that very same God was the one that literally raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the grave alive and well. And he walked among mankind and spoke among them. I heard about an atheistic teacher who was trying to dissuade his students from believing in the miracles in the Bible. And he was talking about <laughs> 
Pharaoh and, and where the Bible talked about that the waters had overcome Pharaoh and his army and they drowned. He said, he said really, that, that's not really what happened. He said, the waters didn't part. What had happened was that when Moses went through the Red Sea, that the water was only six inches deep. And the waters really didn't part. One little boy who grew up as in a Christian home, he said, boy, what a miracle. And that professor said, how do you claim that to be a miracle? He said, a miracle? He said, for God to drown those soldiers in six inches of water? That is a miracle. Amen. Oh, my friend, I want you to understand. I believe what the Bible says. That Moses raised his arm with the staff, and the waters parted. If God can create the sky and the stars of the sky, why can't he do that? He can do anything he wants to do with his creation. And so, therefore, we understand Abraham's faith. Now, in order to understand it, what I want to do is just for a moment go back to Genesis chapter 15. And in, in, in the first five verses, I want you to listen to what happened in that situation. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 5. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. You're exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Abraham's facing a human impossibility. There's no hope in Abraham. I mean, after all, Abraham's 99 years old. His wife Sarah's 89 years old. How in the world are they going to have a child that will be an heir of his seed? What a human impossibility. A human impossibility. There was no hope. And so you notice what you see of the faith that he had in a person. Look with me in verse 19 and 20 of that chapter. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Think about it. Human impossibility. 
Here is a man 99 years old. Here is his wife, 89 years old. And God's, God's told him, hey, you're going to have a child. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. That's a humanly impossibility. And yet, have you ever wondered why God waited till Abraham was that, was that old to give him that promise? I mean, after all, if it had told him when he was 20 or 30 years of age and Sarah was 20 years of age, that would not have been no miracle. I mean, that would just been a normal thing. But God waited until Abraham was beyond the age of him, a possibility to give seed to a woman who her womb was dead. He did it for a reason. He did it because he wanted to prove that he was a God of miracles. And by faith, Abraham said, I believe. Now, I don't know about you, but I promise you, if I'd been in that situation, I don't know if I would have believed that quick. The Bible says in Genesis 17, it says, when Abraham, in verses, verses 1 through 6, it says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Oh, my friend. Do you not see what I'm talking about here as we look at God's promise to Abraham that his fruit would be multiplied exceedingly and, his fa and he would be the father of many nations. So it remind me about a, a man and a woman both 90 years old and they got married. And the first thing they did, they moved next to an elementary school. Now, that's faith, my friend. <laughs> but here is uh, Abraham. And the Bible says he really couldn't believe what God was saying. In fact, he tried to help God out. He said, well, now, God, I know that I already have a son by the name of Ishmael, and my heir can come from Ishmael. God says, oh, no. That's not the way it's going to be. The way it's going to be is going to be your seed and Sarah's womb. And out of that will come the seed that will be multiplied beyond the stars in the sky. Abraham had to make a decision when God told him that. He could either look upon circumstances 
or he could look upon Almighty God. Have you ever thought about that? That when you're faced in life, you have a decision to look at circumstances or look at God. Circumstances will deceive you. Circumstances will lie to you. Circumstances can't do what God can do. Charles Spurgeon said this, look at yourself and your doubts will increase. Look at Jesus and they will disappear. How true, how true that is. Abraham had a decision. He either had to believe or not believe. And the Bible says he believed. And the Bible says, then verse 22, then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. God's last word was, there is no more discussion. In other words, God said it, whether I believe it or not, it's going to be done. But Abraham chose to believe. But I want you to see one last thing, and that is the faith in the power of God. He says, and in verse 21 and 22, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I want you to see something that will blow your mind. He believed, he believed before the miracle took place. He didn't wait till Isaac was born, but he believed before it took place. The Bible reminds us that when God promises us something, my friend, it is a sure thing. It is a sure thing. It was not when Isaac was born before that God wrote down beside Abraham that his righteousness before me. He performed his promise. And then the Bible says in Genesis 21, verse 1 and 2, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. What made Abraham's faith so great? God did something so unique in Abraham's life. You think about it. Abraham did not have a cross of Calvary that he could look to. Abraham did not have a tomb that was empty. Abraham did not have a Bible that we have today. Abraham did not have others around him that was exercising faith that he could draw from their faith. In fact, his wife laughed at him and those that was around him laughed as well. Abraham didn't have Hebrews chapter 11 to go back and to review of how what God had done in their life. That's what made Abraham's faith so vital. Now, isn't it a shame we as people today, we have a church. We have a church history that, that has expressed martyrs of the faith time in and time after. 
Isn't it amazing we have a cross, we have a tomb, an empty tomb? Isn't it amazing we have Hebrews chapter 11, and yet we still don't believe? We still don't believe? That's what makes Abraham's faith so amazing. Well, friend, I want you to see something very quickly, and we're going to close the proclamation of his faith. It says it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He says in verse 24, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord and from the dead. See, faith is no better than its object. Faith takes one to heaven and it's not just a faith in God. It's a faith in a God who can raise the dead to life. See, it's more than just believing in Jesus Christ. It's believing in Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead. Right. Friend, don't overlook that fact. Now, have you stopped to think about it? Physically, Abraham and Sarah was dead. But supernaturally, he brought life to their body. Physically, Jesus died upon the cross. Supernaturally, he brought him up from the grave alive. So, my friend, today, we are here celebrating a God who keeps his promises that whosoever believes, whosoever has faith, whosoever who trusts in the name of the Lord and believed that God had raised him from the dead, thy shalt be saved. Oh, friend. And that's just the beginning of our journey of faith with the Lord. God gives us opportunities after opportunities after opportunities to exercise our belief, our faith in Almighty God. How's your faith today? Is your faith contagious? Does others look at your faith and say, man, there is a man or a woman of faith? I'd like to have that kind of faith. The same kind of faith that Abraham had is the same kind of faith that you and I need to have today. 